Brother, thank you for your, the word that kept coming to mind for me as you were talking was humane. Just a humane, understanding, personal, as you're going through the text, bit by bit, it was a very understanding, um, the word real is stupid. Uh, Understanding where people live, identifying with people, empathetic uh, exposition of that text, and I was great grateful for it. Two reflections on it, just personally on it, uh, especially as we're talking about we are called to live and die. It occurs to me that the elder office, the shepherding office, has, has some things in common with other positions of leadership, but there is something very different in the way Jesus led and the way we're called to live as, as elders that's upside down in that you're being called to live and die and just to serve others. And, and I think the world doesn't naturally get that. We like, we like oversight, but we don't like giving away and dying for others. And it occurs to me that immature people in the church often covet the office of elder and they don't understand. It's about self-sacrifice, you know? It's, it's about giving yourself up. You know, you sure you want to do that? Because that's what this is all about. Um, and there's a long or wrong ideas about it. And that, that leads me to my second reflection on this. Uh, I think one of the key distinctions between a young Christian and a maturing Christian is often this pastoral instinct that's always looking to serve others. And like a little picture of that I think of is, is just in a reflection of my own life how my temptation, for instance, is often sitting in a, a context like this. I, I might want to, and you, you'll remember stories of this, Mark. I'll want to ask a question that kind of satisfies my intellectual itch as opposed to, say, asking a question in a Sunday school context that's going to serve everybody around me. You know, and that as one kind of picture of a difference between young, immature Christian and growing to serve others is that pastoral instinct. Lift others up. And I felt like your talk just exuded that. Any other reflections, brothers, from Burke's talk? I like the way that he tied in the uh, prior verses in chapter four. You know, chapter and verse divisions are helpful, but they are artificial. And sometimes they can kind of skew things and making the connection between uh, joyful suffering in 412 through 17 as the prelude to then the charge to the elders I thought was very helpful and very well done it just reminds us again that's part and partial of the calling uh, of being an elder amen I love it anytime we we're pointing to Ezekiel 34 uh, that's a good passage for pastors to remember and especially then it's so sweet when the Lord says he will come and shepherd the flock himself it's such a preview of Christ Anything else, brothers? Yeah, just a good word. Just uh, pastoral, helpful, searching. Um, I especially appreciated the the ways in which you were strumming the chord about the burden of ministry, uh, where there was the image of it being piled on the back and, and sort of cast off into Christ's lap repeatedly or the weariness of eyes uh, that, that, that are sort of seeing uh, the burdens and the struggles, man. So just helpful to the soul. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah, I always appreciate in pastor's conferences where there's at least one message that speaks to the soul of the pastor and, and what he, he bears. Because a lot of times we come to these conferences and we're, we're tired. I'm sure there's some brothers here today who are thinking about quitting. With this many guys in the room, there has to be. And so you're always kind of waiting for, like, who's going to give that talk that speaks to the, the weary soul of the pastor? So just thank you for doing that. And, and thanks for your word about pulpiteering. I really appreciated that because that happens in churches. And in some ways it's well-meaning because the congregation will say, man, we're so blessed by your preaching and that's good. And they're like, we want to, the phrase is free you up to preach, which in some ways is right. You, you, want, you don't want the pastor to be overburdened with, say, administration or things like that. But in other ways, they don't realize that that's unhelpful because to preach well, you have to be among them to know where they're at and how to do application and how the text is going to land in their lives. So that was just really helpful. I think it's a temptation uh, to be guarded against. As Danny was saying about the progression of the text from suffering to leadership, it's just a sobering reminder that we're not called to this work for celebrity or fame 
or money. The challenge he was giving these elders was in light of the suffering that the church would, was experiencing and would experience and the leader was to be out front and was in a vulnerable position. It was just sobering to remember uh, that. Yeah. Now, if, if I go to questions uh, f from the audience, do we have more microphones? Do we have guys who could run around? And if not, we could grab two of these. Do you guys have more or do you want two of these? You have no more, so you need two of these. Okay. While you guys are getting ready, I have one more question for you brothers. And as you guys think about questions you might want to ask, what do you do to encourage young men to be elders? Maybe they're still immature in the faith, but Thabiti, I remember you were talking about, can you see this young man who's in many ways still worldly, but he's exercising leadership somehow, even in bad ways, and you have a vision to see him raised up, or just, or other men in the church. What do you guys do to help encourage young men to catch a vision for this shepherding sort of role uh, to aspire to be elders? How do you, practically speaking, preach the word, Mark will say, yes, but beyond your pulpit ministry, and maybe you want to me meditate on this, and what do you do to encourage young men to grow up into elders? While we're answering that, let me just suggest the two guys with the microphones, find somebody who has a question, and get your microphones to them so we're ready. Great. I would say this, Jonathan, you have to be involved in their lives, so it's basically discipleship. Uh, you'll begin to pour your life into some men, and it will become obvious over time, no, the, God's hand is not on this person for the office of the elder. They may be a good person. They may be a fine uh, follower of Christ, but it just becomes evident this is not their calling. In other cases, you're going to deal with men, and there's a hunger that takes off for the word. There's a passion that develops for lost people. There's a desire. You know, words, I could see myself doing this like for the rest of my life. When you begin to see that kind of impetus in their life, then I think you begin to, if you, in, a, in a good way, press, encourage, challenge, uh, that this indeed might indeed be something that God has for you. And let's go for it and see what happens. Great. Thank you. I found that if, if, if our preaching is missiological, uh, I believe that in many ways missiology is the mother of theology and um, that missiology ought to be the warp and woof of all our ministry and preaching. Um, and when we are preaching w with a missiological emphasis, um, men, men will naturally sort of rise up to answer the call, uh, to serve the Lord in any capacity. And when a man, I, I think, when God puts the desire to serve him, he's not saying, well, I wanna be this or I wanna be that necessarily. Sometimes that happens, but I think generally say, I just wanna give my life to fulfilling the fullness of the Great Commission. I'm not sure what that's gonna look like. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll go to seminary, I'll take whatever number of years it means. I'll go and I'll do it because I wanna give my life and, and, and be faithful to the Lord's calling to fulfill the fullness of the Great Commission. And, and they, they sort of almost come out and, and they're there. You know, guy who says, I want to be in ministry, but he's never in worship, or he doesn't come to evening worship, or he's never in Wednesday night worship or fellowship, he doesn't come to Bible study, he's not called to ministry. He's certainly not called to shepherding. And so a guy will naturally just rise up, and he will be there, and he will be hungry for the Word, hungry for theology, and it's almost as if the Lord, again, raises them up, and we just identify them. Yeah. Last word. Amen to that. Um, just two very simple things. One is suggested to young men. Uh, it's amazing how many very sort of good godly men go on about life doing good godly things never think of themselves as, as elders potentially. Uh, and so the, the, to merely suggest it to the men of the church, I think it's helpful for getting it on the radar. Tell, tell me what that sounds like. Like what, what, do you, what do you actually say? You ever thought about being an elder? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Excellent. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever thought about being an elder? <laughs> the, the second thing I think that can be helpful is I think, I think most men, um, mo most good Christian men, actually want to be strong men of some sort, however they're thinking about that. And I think it's good to just hitch that to 1 Timothy 3. That, that part of all that's being described there in part is mature manhood. 
-hmm. to the degree that it could be exemplary for the rest of the congregation. Uh, and so to begin to connect their notions of what it is they're trying to grow into to 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, um, the older men in, um, in Titus 2, and so on, um, and to sort of narrow the gap between sort of their, their visions about manhood and this particular aspect of, of Christian leadership. Uh, friends, because we're so short on time, I'm going to limit questions to just uh, questions that don't involve stories about your church, right? So if, if we need a long description of some story in your church where this is going on and we're looking for counsel, let's, let's talk to one of us afterwards. That'd be a great place to do that. But maybe just quick one or two sentence questions that you would have for us. Right here on the left. In Name and church. Craig Buckley. Uh, Happy Home Church in the community of Happy Home, North Carolina. And just keep that rusted on your chin. <laughs> okay. There we uh, go. Craig Buckley, Happy Home Church in the community of Happy Home, North Carolina. Um, in Timothy and Titus, at least in the New King James, the, over the title of the chapter, it says qualifications for elders, but the word bishop is used in the text. And I haven't had a lot of training with eldership. But what is the difference, or is there a difference in shepherd, pastor, elder? Uh, that type of thing. And also, does it suggest anywhere to have more than one elder per congregation? Brothers? Well, the quick answer is the terms are interchangeable. You have the word poimen, presbyteros, and episkopos that are used in Acts 20, 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, 1 Peter 5. And uh, you see the terms are used interchangeably to speak of the same office. So a pastor is an elder, is a bishop. That, that one's easy. Plurality? Are we commanded to have? Acts chapter 20 is another example of that, where you have the church in Ephesus singular and the elders plural that come from there. First Peter 5 has all three. I write to the elders among you, be shepherds of the flock of which God has made you overseers. They're overseers, same word for bishop. And I think to your question about is it commanded, uh, of course, as Mark read from the Westminster Confession of Faith yesterday in section one, that it is not only those things expressly written down. This is one of those things expressly written down, but it's also those things that are deduced by good necessary consequence. And this is the example of the New Testament. Uh, like membership in the church. This is exemplified in the New Testament. It's shown forth as the pattern of the church. And so as that pattern is shown, as it is implied that there are a plurality of elders, that example sets forth uh, that pattern that we are to follow. I would say a pattern to follow, and it also sets forth a, a discipleship mandate. Part of your job as a pastor is to raise up other elders. The fact that, that it's always in the plural means I have a job to do. Raise up others, disciple. Next question. Over here. Uh, growing up in name, a name and church and my name from? is Thomas Swope, and I'm going to Colonial Baptist Church in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Great, thank you. Um, growing up in a context where, um, if you're called to be a pastor, you'll have this this experience where you fall down on the knees and receive the call. Um, I've never felt that, but I love the the work described in First Timothy chapter three. How do you advise or counsel a young guy who's trying to discern whether or not he's being called to full-time pastoring? HB? <laughs> well, I saw the joy in your face with the question. So just... And I'm uh, wrestling with Mark here. <laughs> I oh. missed the end of the question. What, what was the end oh, of the question? Oh, I'm sorry. Who, anybody else on that then? I don't mean to. The question was basically, how do you discern? He, he, he hasn't call? had a profound, on his knees, weeping before the Lord sense of calling. Yeah, I, I think it's been referenced in the previous message um, and throughout the conference, starting in 1 Timothy 3 and 1, the desire. Um, and I would say it that as it clarifies, there is a consuming desire that becomes a woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. I think it starts there with um, not necessarily any falling down, hearing voices, not necessarily any uh, Damascus-like road experience, but God 
doing something in your heart. The rest of that passage begins to examine what one's life looks like. And as was mentioned several times, what are you already doing for the Lord? And if there is already a life of godly character and Christian service, that should be affirmed somehow by people in the church who see the hand of the Lord on you, is what I would say. You know, when, you know you're a Christian when Christ does everything to you, because if he's not everything to you, he's nothing to you, as Spurgeon said, right? I think in, in a similar way to what HB is saying is if, if the Great Commission and its fulfillment and your part in taking, uh, your part in that fulfillment is not everything to you, it's nothing to you. Um, it has to consume you in one sense. Um, not, not necessarily in a, a super passionate, you know, way where it's just bubbling out of you, but there's something burning deep within your heart for the nations and for God's people. Um, and, it, and it can't be simply because you taught a class and, you know, the sweet older ladies in the church said, you're a good teacher and you're a nice boy and you ought to be a pastor. Um, <laughs> that, that can sometimes be true and hopefully it is, but, but it really needs to be the elders and those, those who have been trained and who have experience and maturity who are coming alongside saying, you, you do seem to have the gifts for this. Now let's look at the passion and the desire. And there's some men, there's some men who actually have the gifts and the qualifications and the equipment and they don't want to do it and they might be in sin because they don't want to go through the life of suffering that an elder must go through and they need, they need to have a fire lit under their pants.